So um, let's get right into it. So uh, the intention of, of how I'd like to, I think I've imagined this, uh, this conversation going is to sort of introduce to you some tech, tech ideas, some thinking from uh, the tech world that will that is designed to increase uh, the velocity in, in the case of the tech world velocity of software development but in our in our case the impact uh, the velocity of impact that we can have in the world uh, so I'll introduce you to some concepts we'll see if that aligns to uh, to the group vision is that something that is starting to make sense or am I sort of <laughs> creating parallels where there aren't parallels which is okay as well um, get some input from the group around whether some of these things are useful and if anything else needs to be built out. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about my sort of stake in that. Um, and then if we are all aligned, can we covenant together uh, as a group, as a network of, of concerned individuals to a sustainable, uh, maintainable, energizing, uh, productive cadence of what I'm going to call sprints. And we'll explain that terminology a little bit more uh, later on. And then uh, if I can, you know, hopefully keep my conversation, my, my talk down to 30 minutes, then we have lots of product productive time to actually work together on defining uh, a common vision for the network that I think um, will help us be able to propel ourselves forward, get us through the holiday season and then looking into 2021 as an extremely productive time. So that's, that's my intention. I hope that that is okay with you for me to spend a few minutes walking you through some of my thoughts. Thanks, Wendlin. All right, here's the structure, part one, the talk. <laughs> and I came up with all sorts of names and uh, I really like the where, where I landed, agile velocity for radical change. And I think we can all agree that right now, radical change is what we need. Not just, you know, cautious change, not just the normal progress of change, but radical change, radical thinking at, at every level. And so, I, that's my sort of, that was my intention. That was my focus. And I hope that that aligns with what everybody wants to do. And then once I've done that presentation and if hopefully we're all feeling energized and not feeling like we want to just, you know, get another cup of coffee and go back to bed, uh, then we can maybe do some work. And uh, what you'll hopefully gain out of my, uh, one of my theses is that every meeting should have outputs. Every meeting should be actually furthering the work it's great to get together, to get to know each other, to talk, uh, all of that kind of stuff. But we also should be doing work. And let's, you know, I no, <laughs> said you know, that or, you know, let's I make you the, the uh, password. Sure, Jeff, can I get you to go on mute, I just, Jeff? I didn't even need the passcode for some reason. I don't know. All right, we'll just wait for Jeff and Terry to sort themselves. Sorry, I just muted you by accident, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Tom. This is what happens. Jeff comes in the room and I'll focus, right? <laughs> so let's go. Let's get into the talk. Um, again, leveraging agile velocity for radical change. So my name is Tom Oje, as, uh, as Carla introduced. Um, I am the chief technology officer, so a senior executive at a Toronto uh, digital agency called Art and Science. We do really, really cool things. Uh, CTO. So in case you don't know, is sort of the, the technical side of the executive team. And my purview is um, all things related to technology at the company. We're a very technical company. So there's a lot of, of, of breadth there. But primarily, my focus is enabling and managing the engineering team, uh, making sure that all you know, the processes are working. I'm very much on the delivery end of the organization. So we've got other people that are they're very divergent and I can be as well, but I also am responsible for making sure that the software gets built and the websites get produced and, and, and the work gets done. So I'm very much always focused on, okay, enough talk, let's get to action. And, and so um, you know, hopefully that'll sort of come through. Um, how did I get here? I thought it might be useful to sort of provide a little bit of, a, of my journey. Uh, I'm a Guelphite, uh, was, we family moved here in 73 when I was two years old. I was born in Brussels. Uh, my dad, Andre Oje, was an active member of the University of Guelph in the Student Services Department for decades. And uh, I've always been sort of embedded in Harcourt United Church, sort of that if I'm not a particularly churched person, but that if I had to have a home base uh, spiritually, that would be sort of where I started. Um, Winnie the Pooh Nursery School back in the day, <laughs> you know, when I was three years old. So a long history uh, of that. Um, 
And then, you know, on the professional side, as a chief technology officer, when I first got that title and I thought, oh, my gosh, I've arrived. I'm on the C-suite. Oh, this is really great. And then the next thought was, oh, my God, what does a CTO actually do? And so I started this intentional, you know, process journey of discovery. And more recently, I really got serious about it. And I started to have conversations one on ones at a very rapid cadence. But once every two weeks, I'm talking to a new leader in tech. Um, and and having conversations and really just sort of trying to understand what what is the purview of tech leadership? How does that change from company to company? What are some common threads there? Because I've been feeling like lately my world is getting narrowed to like very much an IT kind of tech focused, and that's not really a good acknowledgement of sort of what I'm all about and what gets me excited and what gives me energy. Uh, and speaking of energy, you know. Um, the COVID sort of thing that happened could, you know, it was a really, obviously a very dramatic thing, um, having just moved back to Guelph and trying to figure things out and kind of being happy that uh, didn't have to commute four hours a day when COVID hit. Um, but it also sort of brought to light a lot of interesting things. And there, of course, there's a lot of bad things that are happening with COVID, but it has created a very fertile environment for rapid change. And um my sister is a youth minister at Norval United Church out of Georgetown. And um, when COVID hit, Norval did a phenomenal job of picking one or two very key technologies, some platforms that allowed them to very, very easily, very seamlessly transition from an in-person worship. They had just bought a new building, a beautiful facility. They were only there for a month and then they had to shut it down and they transitioned online and did a phenomenal job of meeting people where they were on Facebook, on YouTube uh, and, and managed through a little bit of technology, but so through some very, very clever thinking and clever programming, managed to take the community with them, uh, take that congregation with them. And in fact, uh, because of technology, because of COVID, and because they're doing such a great job, they've managed to sort of extend their reach out to the world. And so on every Sunday morning, we have thousand people that, that attend service from all over the world. And that's really, really in interesting. And to me, that that is a perfect example of the opportunity that we have here. There's a bit of a radical shift and that has enabled a, a bunch of new things. And so many people are, well, when are we gonna get back to normal? When are we going to, um, when are we, you know, when are we going to be able to go back to the way things are, or how can we re reproduce the things that we were doing before online? And 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 there's a missed opportunity there. There's there's a way to embrace the changes and take it one step further. Use that as a catapult a catalyst to get you to get you further. So that sort of gave me a lot of energy and enthusiasm that change could be possible and that technology played a role in that. And then you know. So Tammy Taywinkle is a, a longtime friend of mine and is part of this group and couldn't be here this today. Uh, she said, you know, you got to join this group. You got, you got all this energy, you got these ideas, join this group. And by the way, you got to talk to this Jeff guy. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I, and I did, and, and Jeff and I hit it off. And as we were talking and he was, you know, talking about the failure of government and the need for radical change and, and how things were getting bogged down in slow processes. And I was like, that's the same problem that I've been trying to solve uh, for years in the agency world. And I've always been looking to the software engineering world saying, hey, what can we borrow from the way they do things? Because software gets spit out at an extraordinarily rapid pace now. What have they done right? And why are we getting bogged down in process and, and, and meetings and all this sort of stuff? And so that's where I started to sort of pull in these threads of agile methodology into my world. And I thought if I could stretch it a little bit, can I stretch it a lot more? Is there stuff here that would be relevant to social purpose and to other, other folks? And that's when I started getting excited. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta share this. This is some really exciting stuff. I hope it is, I hope it works. Um, let's see, um, let's, let's, let's get right into it. Um, first of all, just, you know what? Let's just, there's a lot, what gives me energy? Lots of stuff, uh, lots of stuff, creative stuff, uh, people stuff and strategy stuff. Uh, and, you know, I think, Today, uh, I'm going to sort of put on that strategy hat and talk to you a little bit about agile methodology, which is at the bottom of this list. And, um, and I hopefully sort of start to take some of those lessons that are coming from the, the tech world, the farmer world, the strategy world, and apply it, apply it here. So let's talk about um, the opportunity that I see. I sort of mentioned it. Um, I've seen, and I don't know if you've seen this as well, but on your social networks, like in March, things started to shift. And the stuff, the messages that you were seeing, at least I was seeing anyway in my sort of, in my feeds and in my social spheres 
was starting to shift toward a fo focus on social purpose. People were for the first time questioning Jeff Bezos of Amazon and saying, what, what's going on? This is not right. And, and we were seeing, you know, obviously there's all the po politics down south that we were seeing, but lots of other stuff was starting to happen. And, and, and it was just was speaking to sort of a bubbling of, of gra groundswell, right, of, of sort of renewed focus on, hey, something's not quite right with the status quo of the world. And then, of course, more recently, uh, not more recently, but of stark focus recently with Black Lives Matter and so forth has been the spotlight on diversity and inclusivity, which is a theme that I'm predicting will be a huge, huge, huge factor in business in 2021. And of course, social purpose has been there for forever, but uh, it's great to see the rest of the world catch up. And, and, and that's, I find that very exciting and also speaks to a desire to sort of write things, fix some really, really broken systems. Um, the opportunity is this low barrier uh, to entry. You know, at 8.55 today, I was refilling my coffee. At 8.57, I was shaving, did a pretty poor job. And at nine o'clock, I was in a meeting with, with you folk. Uh, I wasn't, you know, commuting. I wasn't going to the basement of a community center. I wasn't, didn't have to, <laughs> you know, I am wearing pants, despite what the RBC commercial says, I am wearing pants. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, it's so, easy to just drop into something and then pop out. Um, there's lots of problems with that, but the opportunity is that there's a lower barrier to entry, to get involved, to just jump in a Zoom meeting. And, and I've, I've been doing this with glee for the past six months, just popping into various groups. So, oh, we got a Zoom, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about systemic racism. Sure, I'm, I'm really, really interested. Let me, let me participate. So low barrier to entry. If we could take advantage of that, the problem, the low barrier of entry is the low investment. So you pop in, you pop out, then you move on to other things, you jump on the Netflix. So we need to sort of take advantage of the low barrier to entry, but then give people some very, very easy ways to then start to do, right? So, okay, you, you're in that meeting, you got all worked up. How do we take that energy and actually apply it as opposed to just flit away to something else? So we have to be vigilant of that. And of course, digital enablement, digital transformation is a big buzzword in the industry right now. And we've seen that in the education system. My kids are, my kids are, my kids are a whole other thing, but they're, um, they're working, you know, at their computers right now in the kitchen and I can hear them fighting, which is distracting. But, you know, that's just a sign of the failure of our systems to sort of meet the needs of the time. And we just weren't ready for it. So people are thinking about digital transformation as well. And, 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 and part of the reason is, the failure of traditional systems, traditional networks, traditional governments of solving these problems at velocity, solving these problems in the amount of time that we needed. The failure to look at, you know, the failure to properly put into place structures to support public health, basic survival. And we're seeing that. And there's, there's an uprising. There's a feeling that this all needs to change. I got some computer diagrams here. These are network diagrams from information security uh, and information design uh, practices, but they also can be can apply to lots of different things. The one in the middle, for example, can be used to describe neural networks and the way the brain works and the way the universe is organized and the way plant systems are organized and so forth. The one on the left is a way of representing conventional government with you know a bunch of powerful people at the middle, lots of inputs, kind of keeping them moving in the center, keeping them static and then creating institutions that exist for self-preservation. And so there's a huge amount of energy that is wasted on preserving existing systems rather than getting work done. On the right, we have a distributed network, which is a great way of getting one task accomplished by lots of people. We've heard about crowdsourcing, we've heard about cloud computing, they all are distributed networks. They're great for if you have one task, but in the social, purpose sphere, we have lots of different people with lots of different energies, lots of different experiences, wanting to do lots of different things. As long as they align on a vision within that network, they should be allowed to move autonomously, form small, agile, rapid groups that are loosely organized, but are connected to have accountability to each other and can share resources. And that's the beauty of the decentralized network. Uh, just some words, uh, these coming uh, from, from some slides that Jeff put together around sort of contrasting the traditional government centralized network approach to the power of decentralized networks or what I'm calling a social purpose network. And you got bad words on the left and good words on the right. So we don't need to really dwell on this. 
except that you know on, on the social on this decentralized network we've got a connected group of people that share a common vision that is built on a on, on a on, on a platform of trust and authentic engagement uh, through transparency and that network, the redundancy within the network, the, the, the interconnectedness of the, the weave of that fabric creates resilience and allows us to then grow the pie out instead of competing for limited resources, extend that network out and just sort of add on. And that of course can transform into limitless results. So that's the inspirational part right there. And I'm gonna take a sip of whatever this is. I don't recommend it by the way, it's peach and pear, which were never meant to coexist. Now, all of that cheerleading is not to say that there aren't challenges with the decentralized network. And that I think represents a large part of why we don't see more of this stuff happening. Um, the challenges on the network side is, is that, is, how do we, you know, if we have all these different moving parts that have autonomy, how do we maintain a focus? How do we share a vision? How do we coordinate all of these things so that we actually get stuff done? This, isn't, it a, isn't it an economy of scale, but the sort of the law of diminishing returns that the more people you add to a problem, the, the less you actually get done per person. So how do you sort of scale and how do you coordinate? Uh, and then how do you measure the impact? If everyone's doing their own thing, how do we know that this is actually working, that this is having an impact? Where's the accountability? And all of that sort of means we need to really spend some time defining a common vision, a North Star that we can all align to, to make sure that our actions are supporting that vision and not sort of pulling us and distracting us in different directions. On the practice side, so those, you know, when you look, I'm just gonna flip back to that diagram there. So when we look at these individual nodes that are connected by little, almost atoms, right? On the practice side, the challenge is really, if you're small and you're just starting out, how do you gain traction? How do you actually start to see your impact out there, which is a virtuous cycle and encourages you to keep going? And how do you, you know, you've just four or five people, how do you find resources and, 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 and navigate and pull together, you know, the people, the information, the funding, the, the tools that you need? Um, and of course, that's the answer is the network, but we'll we'll get there in a second. How do you extend your reach beyond your small group of people so that you are having an impact and you are affecting multiple? And then where's the accountability? How does that piece work? You know, are you just accountable to yourselves? How do you try to transmit your impact and your accountability back to the network so that everyone sort of stays on par and gets stuff done? And for that, we need to define the mission. And I'll talk a little bit later on about the difference with that I see between a vision and a mission, but the mission is at the practice level. The vision is shared across the network. Uh, here's, you know, my, my amoeba art, um, which just sort of re-illustrates the concept of, you know, communities of practice within a network. So the network, that's us, uh, that's the shared vision um, that then informs individual areas of practice where your energy is and where you're going to be able to contribute the most. And you can be part of multiple areas of practice and sort of, you know, be playing in different worlds, or you can be in one, uh, you could be a one single person leading that particular charge or a group of people We could involve people that are kind of outside the network that don't have the same accountability, or maybe not the same vision, but can still help us in our in our jobs. And so there's, it's this sort of amorphous thing and that this blobby nature is both the strength and the challenge, right? You can just imagine that a blob could fit through cracks and do all sorts of stuff, but it's hard to define. So we need to have that shared vision, that vector that we can all be pointing to and say, I'll get there one way, you'll get there some other way, but we're gonna get there. So this comes down to, and this is a term that, that, that Jeff Wilson introduced me to called fractal governance. And a fractal, here's a one example, there's many examples of fractals and, and it's a, it's a it's a pattern, it's a mathematical equation, but it's also a pattern that we see in nature and in the world. This looks like a tree, like a fern or something, but you see this in river deltas and you see this in volcanoes, you see this all over the place. Uh, so it obviously works in nature and it's just this notion that we've got nodes and leaves and smaller, smaller units and each unit is autonomous and or self-organizing, but does contribute to the next step up. And then there's this repetition. And so that can scale almost infinitely, just as long as you've got the right structures in, in place, so you don't get bogged down in a hierarchy. It's still, everything sort of flows through. And so then, you know, if you've got one shared vision, that's your, your trunk, if you will. Um, so uh, fractal governance really talks about grassroots, right? That at that end of the branches of the tree, that's where the work actually happens. That's where the people are. And it's very, very grassroots right down to the individual level. So it's, it's groups of motivated 
people that are empowered to uh, and, and connected to each other. That's where the network comes in. It's polymorphic as we sort of saw like amoeba-like, uh, but that means it's highly adaptable and it can, it's resilient to change. Um, and it allows, because it's these smaller groups, it allows people to move at a very, very high velocity, which means that you could be disruptive. And that's what we need to be. We need to be disruptive here now, take advantage of the opportunity that, that, that today offers us in 2021 is looking really like it could be a very interesting year. And if it isn't, it represents a real failed opportunity, I think, for all of us. So I'm in favor of this notion of fractal governments, of small connected groups that are highly agile and operating at high velocity. I did, I did say agile. So what's agile? So I'm gonna to talk to you about a little bit about the software world. So in the seventies, the very, very smart engineers at Xerox Park and at Sun Microsystems and IBM came up with this waterfall methodology, which if you've ever been involved in a big project, you may have seen something called a Gantt chart, which is a dependency graph that shows in order to get this task done, this task must be accomplished first. And there's a, that, there's a truth to that, that some things depend on other things. But the waterfall methodology takes that to the nth level where it says everything depends on things. And so you cannot actually proceed with one thing until something else has been accomplished up to that. And in order to sort of map all that out, you've got to do a ton of planning. And that's sort of this specs, specifications driven, documentation driven methodology uh, that was really required because when computers were punch cards and you were, you know, there was a lot of energy just to even write a few lines of code, you didn't want to have to do it again. So plan it all out. And that kind of worked back in those days because the pace of change was fairly slow. We were building really, really, really big systems. But by 2001, the tech stack had dramatically changed and the way people approached software and the, what the world needed of IT and, and of software development had become much more immediate and by the time you finished writing the spec for your amazing idea, your amazing two-year pro software project plan, someone had already come up with something else. Or the tech, tech landscape had completely changed and invalidated half of your methodology. And so you were, we were seeing just massive amounts of failure in the software industry because of the, the, the glacial pace at which change was able to, to be effectuated. And the fact that change is becoming more and more and more of a thing. So a group of very smart people got together in 2001 and created a manifesto uh, for the agile methodology, uh, which consists of a set of beliefs. So the manifesto, which I'll share with you in a moment, and then a set of ceremonies, which is just the word that they use. Uh, so I'll use that language. Uh, and I'm sure that there are many analogs in our other practices that, that we could sort of relate to this. But the ceremonies are basically certain events that must occur at a regular cadence in order to move things forward, but it's the, a very stripped down, very minimal, very sort of results focused set of activities, but you need to sort of follow those ceremonies regularly in order to keep things moving forward. And that's relying on the power of people to move things forward as, a, as opposed to the value of process. So here's the Agile Manifesto for software development. Uh, so we favor individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That's not to say we don't use processes and tools, but we favor individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We favor working software over comprehensive documentation, either before or after the software is built. We, we prefer customer collaboration in an iterative way, as opposed to rigorous contract negotiation, specs, deliverables, scope, that sort of thing. And we prefer to respond, embrace and respond to change versus following a plan. So that's the Agile Manifesto for software development. Let's see how that could be massaged to apply to social purpose. Can the software development methodology be leveraged for radical social change? I believe it can. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you today. <laughs> The universe likes speed. Now this quote was written by a pop psychologist, but I think it, the message is actually still very powerful. The universe likes speed. So don't delay, don't second guess, don't doubt. When the opportunity is there, the impulse, when the 
spirit moves you, however you want to talk about that, act. That's your job. That's all you have to do. That's what we want to do. Isn't that sound so simple? Just, I'm energized. Let's do it. And I've been seeing that, you know, but Carla is about that. Jeff is about that. I think, I believe that many of you are about that. I like that too. A week ago, it didn't even occur to me that I would be talking to you, let alone presenting some ideas about agile methodology, let alone facilitating a vision session. So, but it was there. I got worked up. I acted. Let's all do that. So I took the software manifesto and I'm like, okay, I think there's something there, but the language doesn't quite work. We're not shipping software here, right? We're not, you know, we don't have customers in the traditional sense of the term. So that doesn't map one to one. So I massaged a little bit. This is where the, the creative side of Tom comes out, I guess. I still think we want to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. I think the value that I'm pulling out of the software ag agile shipping methodology is we want to favor rapid iteration, rapid iteration, doing something, learning from it, doing something, learning from it, doing something new, learning from that over long range planning, because we do not know what the future is going to hold. We want to, we want to focus on immediate collaboration over delegation. We have got to do delegation, but let's focus on immediate collaboration and let's focus on responding to change. This is another one of the originals over following a plan. So I'll break that down a little bit. Okay, favoring individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So the focus of course is on your energy, you and your network. And, and as that extends out, it's the human capital, it's the social equity, it's the relationships that we have, it's the energy that we bring, it's not the processes and the tools. So we only wanna build what we have to. You know, and I'm a software guy and when Jeff started talking to me and Carla started talking about the group and I'm like, oh, I could build you some software. And it's like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. That's time consuming. That's expensive. That's risky. Build only what you have to. Use what's out there and get work done now. And there's some tactics that, you know, we'll talk about a little later to sort of that'll help propel us in that direction and sort of fulfill that, that mandate. Favor rapid iteration over long range planning. And that doesn't mean you can't have a roadmap. It just means as you're sort of looking at that roadmap, it is a line in the sand. It is a sort of an aspirational thing. This is where we think this is going to go, but we are completely open to that changing. And that roadmap is a living thing where priorities shift and we move faster in one area, we reach a roadblock in another. That's the roadmap. And we want to, we want to curate that roadmap, but we want to, focus on the rapid iteration. That's where the work gets done. That's where the change starts to happen. And so we need to have a sprint cadence. We need to say, we are going to kind of covenant to get work done at this pace. We're gonna meet every whatever. In the software world, the sprint cadence tends to be every two weeks, but that's usually because you have a bunch of people that are working in the office together, they're being paid, you know, like there's a concerted effort there. So a sprint cadence in a volunteer social purpose network could be a lot slower at the network level, and yet at the individual group level, you can establish whatever sprint cadence makes sense to you and that you have energy to, to execute on and that you can commit to and that is sustainable. The buzzword or the, the phrase that we have in software is ship early and often, which means get software out there and, and in a proper sprint process, you're shipping software every two weeks. That means working software is going back out to the users Every two weeks, you're making small changes, listening to feedback, making small changes. And you're deciding at that every sprint, what are we working on this sprint? What are we working on for the next two weeks? All right, let's focus on that. What can we reasonably get done? What do we have the energy to do? What do we have the cadence for? Let's get that done. Um, so it's incremental. Let's focus on immediate collaboration over develop over delegation, right? What can we get done right now together? And we're gonna to try to do that today. After I finish my you know, talking, we're gonna hopefully get down to some really meaningful work. And we wanna focus on those outputs. How can we actually like, you know, the traditional method of having the, having the treasurer and the secretary, the secretary's taking notes at the board meeting and then those notes have to get edited and redacted and sent out and approved and da -da 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 -da. And the notes themselves are just a means to an end. Why are you not actually just collaborating on the document that's gonna, gonna go out and it's done and it's now done and now we can move on to the next thing. So let's 
try to focus on immediate collaboration. What can we get done together right now versus delegation? Although we all need heads down time, we all need our time to work and do other things. So there is going to be responsibilities and delegation, but it's the art. I love this. Remember this. If there's nothing else that you remember from this whole rambling talk, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. Can we maximize the amount of work not done while also maximizing impact? So at every stage you say, is this really necessary? I have a term uh, that we use at art and science called gold plating, which just means, you know, the project's done and now you're like adding finishing touches and you're really sort of like, oh, we're gonna enhance this, which we always aspire to be able to do. But these days there's never really enough time to gold plate. We just gotta get that 80% and then move on, get another 80%, and another 80%. And that becomes sort of, like the math of that gets exponential really, really fast. And that was 20% ends up being irrelevant by the time you're at the third or fourth iteration anyway. So can we maximize the amount of work not done? And it's not laziness, it's just being smart. It's just focusing on output as opposed to process. And at Art Science, we have this wonderful expression called show, don't tell. It's not about show and tell, it's show. I wanna see the results, what's the impact? Don't tell me all about it. Talk is cheap, execution is key. And then responding to change over following a plan. Uh, in these uncertain times, change is a fact. And if we try to formulate a plan, who could have predicted? I guess actually Jeff and his crew probably did predict, but who could have predicted that we would be so disrupted in so many different ways a year ago, right? So how can you plan anything when that kind of disruption is imminent and is happening all the time? And not only that, the technological landscape is changing, the political landscape is changing. There's so many things we need to be able to be positioned to be agile. So a plan will likely be a waste of time. It'll be one of those things, those activities that constitute work and energy and effort and not really fun work necessarily that will be wasted. Be all those software features that you thought were really important. And when the software got out into the world, users just don't use it. But you spent six months developing that feature. So you hold on to it, but it's not of value to anyone. That should have been just ignored altogether and never even started. To do a good job of this, we do need to think about the data, though. We want to follow some actual data, not just our gut. So there's a bit of an accountability and impact management piece that I'm very excited to sort of build out over time. And, and we can talk about that at some future time. Um, and then there's this notion of we have this shared vision, what's that roadmap and let's nurture it, but let's not hold on to any part of it too hard. Uh, at the bottom of each of those previous slides, I had these tactics and, and I'm not gonna go into them here, uh, but as I've been you know, thinking about this stuff, I've been pulling from various things that I've seen in industry or that we've done at Art and Science, uh, tools that have been really, really useful. And I you know, welcome the opportunity to sort of build these out a bit more. And perhaps if the group feels like they're interested in one or the other, um, you know, then to work on that. And that's where my energy could be. Um, but I think the most important is the notion of the Zoom meeting playbook. Um, I mean, I think we do a really good job of Zoom meetings and many of us have been in, in them, but there are things that work and things that don't. The problem of Zoom meetings is that um, there's a lot of design thinking activities that are really fun to do in a workshop setting when you're in the same room and you can walk up to a whiteboard and you can, we call it body storming, brainstorming, body storming. So you're actually up and moving around and that interaction colliding with people that that's, there's energy there and there's a lot of a lot of positive outcomes of that sort of thing and now we're all behind our screens in zoom but i think we can build a playbook of activities the design thinking activities the systems thinking activities that are really powerful for groups big and small that lend themselves better to zoom than other other activities and so i'm really interested in building out that playbook and and seeing what kind of other kind of activities can we be doing over meetings to again make those meetings productive and have actual outputs so anyway that's I'm just putting it out there if there's interest and, and and energy there this is some stuff that really obviously i'm passionate about and i'd love to share so just to sort of conclude um this whole section on on agile and i hope there's been some some useful things in there for people um i was able to extract seven i think they had 15 agile tenets on the website um and many of them didn't map or, or weren't that clear so i've distilled what i think are seven really useful tenets to kind of remember about uh, that are going to enable radical social change using this this methodology 
I think that our highest priority, at least my thesis here, is that the value here is if you adopt this process, it's to accelerate progress of our mission objectives. And mission objectives being the individual areas of practice um, have these missions and things that they want to actually get done. Um, and so everything that we can should do should be in service of that, of actually making progress toward those objectives and not creating structure and creating, you know, I mean, yes, we want to create community. We want to create that sort of support network. Those are secondary goals to actually getting the work done. And if it turns out, we're like, you know what, there's one person here, they, they should just do it because they can do it better than us. We should all be willing to say, you know what? Yes, that is the right path forward. Obviously, that's not the case, but you know, let's be prepared to sacrifice it all to get more stuff done, to actually achieve more impact and more good. And so that impact is the primary measure, in my opinion, uh, of progress. Um, let's embrace change is a fact, folks. You know it. Let's not look at the old ways of doing things. Let's not look at the things that have slowed our institutions down, uh, our board meetings, our hierarchical structures, our democracies, <laughs> all of those things. Uh, you know, let's let's just focus on embracing change and adopting new processes as they come and adopt and responding to what we learn as we do this work. And that's going to happen from empowered self-organizing teams. And I think that's what we already have here and that's what we're doing. And let's just find ways of making that work even more effectively. And it has to be sustainable activity. If, if we burn out, then we're not doing anybody a service. But we, as we saw with distributed networks and decentralized networks, you can spread that work around. And you, you it's not a matter of you know, squeezing more hours or less hours. It's a matter of picking an appropriate sprint cadence. What is the a reasonable amount of work that we can accomplish in this agreed time period? Okay, that's what we have to work with. We've got all these things that we wanna do. What do we wanna work on this sprint? Okay, now how, how many hours have we got? We've got 20 hours, let's say, or 60 hours collectively for over the, over the next month. All right, let's cut off that task list at 60 hours and let's not commit to doing any more than that. So establishing a really smart sprint cadence and that sprint planning piece is extremely important. And when that gets into the tactics and I'd be happy to sort of get down to the ceremonies and the tactics at some future time. Um, but it's about being sustainable. Um, and then this is a great opportunity to sort of that network thinking is also about diversity and embracing that difference of thought and that enriches the network. And then I want to just reemphasize this lovely line, simplicity is essential and simplicity defined as the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. Let's strip away, strip away, strip away, simplify the process until nothing's left but the work and a little bit of administration over top of that. I want to see hands. I, this has been a great uh, lecture for me, but as far as I know, you know, like, I'm not sure where everybody's at. So. As an Agile team, do we commit to a consistent cadence of sustainable output, rapid iteration, and incremental change? Carlos, Carlos got hands. In the bottom right-hand corner is a little emoji. You can click on it and you can give me some hands. All right, here now there's the first technical.